before I start talking about how, how Django and Pyramid are related, uh, I'd like to talk about what a web framework is. Um, there, are, there are many things that are called web frameworks. Django is called a web framework. Pyramid is called a web framework. Bottle is called a web framework. Rails is called a web framework. These things are, are not like each other on fundamental levels, but they all share one thing in common, and that's that they accept a request from a web browser or another kind of client, and they return a response. So if, if it, they, they call a piece of user-defined user code that returns a response on their behalf. And uh, so if you've written code like this, congratulations, you have written a, written a web framework. Almost everyone has in this room, probably. Um, but every, everything else is a bonus. So to me, anyway, uh, a web framework doesn't particularly need an ORM. It doesn't need any database bindings. It might not have a form generation system. But it's still a web framework. And, and sort of the, 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 the candy, not, not candy-like stuff, but the, but the stuff that helps you build higher level applications is, uh, is really not sort of part of the web framework, but part of a sort of an application server development platform. So. Um, uh, Pyramid is much simpler. Uh, I don't mean this sort of in a judgmental way. I just mean it in a sort of functionality way. Pyramid does a lot less than Django does. Um, so um, it's it's still a web framework, but but you might not recognize it as such if you're if you're a long time Django developer, haven't used a lot of other things. So um, that being said, Django gets a lot of things right. I'm, I'm going to try to try to praise Django as much as I can here. Um, I feel kind of crappy because I didn't know there was a Django sucks talk right before mine, so I don't want to beat up Adrian and, and Jacob too much. <laughs> uh, but I, so I, I, what I feel most crappy about is that I have lots of slides saying why Django is cool, but I don't have any examples. I have lots of detailed examples about the, the sort of critici criticizing bits. So you, you, you should feel free to interrupt me if I'm wrong or if uh, if you feel like I'm stepping on your toes or whatever. But in any case. I would probably be using Django if I came to Python today. You know, I started programming in Python in 1999, and there wasn't Django didn't exist. You know, the only thing there there was was Zope, and Zope was Zope was great. I mean, Zope was fantastic at the time. Um, uh, so if it, you know, all the all the people that are here today who started programming this year or maybe last year or the year before, and you're just sort of, you know, getting getting used to to the web programming stuff. Uh, I would be one of you were, had I started in Python uh, a couple years ago or this year or yesterday. Um, Django Docs. Let's talk about Django Docs for a second. Everybody has to give a hand to, to Adrian and Jacob for writing fantastic <laughs> documentation. Uh, this stuff is, is great. It's, it's so hard to write good docs, and they, those guys did a, a wonderful job. It's not only good for neck beards like me who need to know how things work, but it's great for people who, who, are, who are sort of new to web programming or new to Python, and it brings lots of people into Python. Docs are one of the most important things that, that any framework developer or library developer can write because it floats all boats. It helps people get used to the framework. It gets people excited about it. And uh, these guys have, have sort of set the bar for, for lots of Python things. If Django had not been written, and particularly if the Django docs had not been written, we would still be living in a land of sort of half-crafted readme files and text files that you had to print out mailing list posts and all sorts of stuff. So, that, so that they deserve a bunch of credit for that. Um, Django also does its defaults, right? And when I say defaults, I don't mean sort of its default configuration. I just sort of mean its default choices. Uh, lots of people use a relational database, you know. Uh, very, very good choice. I mean, uh, it you know, lots of people are are satisfied with the way it does templating. Lots of people need to administer different parts of their relational database, and, and Django provides them a way to do that. But at the same time, it's, it doesn't have a, like a weird execution model. It doesn't have like a sandbox or something that would prevent somebody from from actually using other other Python modules. So it's it, it's sort of squarely in the middle. It fits it fits uh, people's brains really well. It's got a nice surface area to it. Um, another thing about Django, the Django does right is that it has a very simple model for views, and views are sort of at the heart of any web framework. You know, things that things that get called in 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 response to some request, they accept the request and they turn a response. 
that doesn't much get, get, get much simpler than that. And we, you know, things have changed in Django since then. There's class-based views and other stuff, but, but it, that's, that's the fundamental model. Uh, there's no magic, and surprisingly, this makes Django really pretty fast. I mean, for, you know, you sort of, you sort of look at Django, and Django's, Django's got a lot of code in it, but Django's also one of the fastest Python web frameworks out there. I, I've done a, a, a bit of benchmarking on it. It's surprisingly fast, so they should be congratulated for that. Uh, Django forms do it right. You know, you can, you can sort of render out a form. Uh, based on your whim at the moment, if you just want to render out some, some fields on a form, submit buttons, that's fine, no problem. Or you can sort of do cruddy stuff like the admin interface does and, and render out a form based on the models that, it, that your application exposes. Both of these things are required. You can't get away with just one of them. And Django gets them exactly right. They're, 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 it's, it's, it's very good at it. Uh, Django extensibility does it right. Uh, I have major quibbles with how Django does extensibility, but, but it works for lots of people. Uh, and, and there's a thriving sort of third party environment where, where people contribute different, different session backends and authentication backends and storage backends. And uh, you know, it seems pe people, people really seem to like it and, uh, and, and contribute lots of stuff to it. And you know, there's also this concept of pluggable apps and things like that that people can reuse. Uh, which is which is nice, and just in in general, Django reality does it right. I mean, there's lots of websites built with Django that are um, high high traffic, high scale, uh, and you just can't argue with success. I mean, there's you know it's 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 a very popular and very scalable, very useful web framework. So WTF? Uh, Django existed when I started to write Pyramid. Um, and I didn't use it. So why, why, why would I do that? Well, I, I have some, I, I, like I said, I came to Python through Zope, uh, so I have no taste, and I expect things to work a certain way, and, and uh, Django didn't fit my brain in, in those ways that, that would make, make it a slam dunk for me to use. I could definitely use it. I could see using it for a project. But I, it didn't feel like we could build the kind of sites that we needed to build, which are sort of very granular security model, CMS-y type things, uh, with just the, the tools that Django gave us out of the box. Um, and also, I think, I think Django, you know, th this, this, this sort of it really isn't a problem with Django, but, but I think for the most part, Django makes some concessions to getting started uh, getting started easily, which, which, which is great because it brings in a lot of new users that, that tend to, to make, um, w when, you, when you've been programming in Python for eight years, tend, tend to not be all that helpful and maybe even a hindrance over some time. So I'll, so I'll get into this. So uh, what's Pyramid? Well, uh, James Bennett, is James here by any chance? I guess not. Uh, he gave a tutorial at last year's PyCon, which was three hours long three hour long tutorial and I watched it. I watched the whole thing. 20 minutes of it had anything to do with anything that's in Pyramid. Uh, Pyramid is just a tiny little corner of Django. It, it, all it does is sort of handle view execution, templating, internationalization, things like that sort of related convenience APIs. And it doesn't have a, a form system. It doesn't have an admin interface. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't prefer any particular persistent system. So it's, it's, it's much, much smaller than Django's is. Um, it's built for extensibility and composition of smaller systems and a large system. So it's got a, it's got a really sort of involved configuration model. It's maybe 10,000 lines of code. 4,000 lines of, of that code is, is that configuration system. And something like Pyramid could be used to build something like Django. Django Pyramid is not really directly comparable to Django. It's sort of a, just, just part of Django. Um, Pyramid's current release supports Python 2.6, 2.7, 3.2, 3.3, so we have, we have Python 3 compatibility, which involved lots of whining and bitching, but, but, it, but it happened. So here's a, here's a small Pyramid program. Um, if you cut and pasted this buffer into an, into an editor window, saved it, ran it, uh, you would wind up with a, with a program that would serve up hello, you know, print hello world if you visited port 8080 in a web browser. So as you can see, there's, there's something that should look pretty familiar in this hello world thing, which is, a, this is a view. It takes a request and returns a response. That should be pretty familiar to you. 
uh, very similar model as, as Django. And really only the way you wire up this thing is kind of different. You know, you, you, you wire it up by creating this, this, this weird thing called a configurator and you, you, you call a couple methods on it to sort of tell, tell the system when to call this particular view callable. In this case, it'll be called when you visit slash hello and then somebody's name, you know, and it'll print hello name. Uh, so that's, uh, that's sort of the simplest possible pyramid program. Does, does this make it a micro framework? Well, it's, it's sort of micro framework like. Um, I, I, I sort of treat micro framework as a marketing term and not really a technology term. So I, I don't know really what the distinction is. I mean, different people have different ideas about what, what it's supposed to do. We, we don't self identify as a micro framework because most, most of the things that do self-identify as microframeworks make concessions to convenience that we, we're unwilling to make because we, we have to make larger systems out of the thing. Um, just for example, like you know, Flask uh, has decorators on views that uh, when they get, you know, they, they, they sort of get evaluated at import time and then it sort of tries to figure out which of the routes comes first or which of the views should be should be uh, queried first. Bottle does a similar thing, except it doesn't even it doesn't even try. It just assumes that you're going to define your application top to bottom in in sort of import, view importance order things like that. F you know, Flask has a model where you import a request and then use a thread local. These these things are all things that save typing, but they're not they're not particularly you know useful for for really big systems. And we tend to build build pretty big, pretty big systems. So. Uh, most people in Pyramid don't uh, write, you know, sort of a file and, and do all that junk to start writing an app. They just run this pcreate program, which creates a scaffold for them. And uh, well, tech, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I sort of get tripped up on the terminology here. I'm not sure if the thing that it comes from is called the scaffold or the generated code is the scaffold or something. I have to go back and look at what I last decided, but. In any case, it's a, it's, a, it's a skeleton project that a bunch of files are generated from, and it generates a Python distribution. And a Python distribution, you, you might also call it a project, is something that has a setup.py that can be installed from anywhere. You, know, uh, you, can, you can upload it to PyPy and somebody can download it and easy install it. So all Pyramid applications are, are Python distributions or Python projects. They don't have to be, but if you use this pcreate thing, that's what you'll, that's what you'll wind up with. Um, there are some higher level frameworks built on top of Pyramid. These are, these are the names of them. This, this crazy name called Ptah. I think it's like some Egyptian god or something. Uh, there's another one called Kadi, which is more of a CMS. There's Pulix, which I don't know much about. I know its name. Uh, there's another one called Substance D, which is more Zope-like. These are actually the pieces that are more like Django than Pyramid is. These are, the, these are sort of systems that make choices about persistence and about which templating system you might use and sort of uh, code layout and things like that. Um, they are sort of Django competitors, although as you can tell, since you've never heard of any one of them, they're not quite as popular. So, um, so uh, I, I'm no genius. Uh, there, there are parts of Pyramid that are j just awful, you know, and, uh, we, you know, we all make mistakes. Uh, but that said, I'm going to make some criticisms of Django uh, despite my ineptness. And I, I encourage people to stop me in real time as I put my foot in my mouth about this stuff. Uh, my, fir my first criticism is that, and this, this, this may be more of a cultural thing than sort of a technical thing. I know why this is, uh, but, but Django avoids setup tools. Um, setup tools is a piece of software that, that lets people specify um, dependencies in a setup pi file and then will download those dependencies when that package is installed. Uh, Django itself doesn't use setup tools because it's just one big package. You can still install it with tools that would normally install, you know, Python packages, but it, but it's, Django itself doesn't have any dependencies, so it doesn't really need to use setup tools. It just uses this thing that 
it's called distutils, which Setup Tools was based on. And this, this sort of makes, makes Django an outlier in the broader Python, particularly the broader Python web community anyway. Um, you, there, there's this convention in, in, lots of, in lots of web projects that use Setup Tools to run Setup by Develop, although as Carl reminded me, uh, you can you can use pip install dash e, which does this, you know effectively the same thing. Uh, you you don't use console scripts, and and Carl also reminded me that you could use distutil scripts, but console scripts are more useful. And if you want to know why, you can ask me later. Uh, and Django apps are are not just sort of extra Python distributions. They're they're sort of a special Django-y thing that that live inside of a project directory. Um, these these things these decisions make make Django sort of an outlier as far as as far as uh, Python web stuff goes, and why why is this important? Well, uh, conventions are important. Share and particularly shared conventions are important. Uh, people get tripped up with small differences between things, and if you present a unified front for Python, the way Python web stuff is done. The support, the support burden for everyone becomes a little bit less because it's spread, spread more evenly. Um, all that said, I, I, I do know why Django, um, Django tries to avoid this because because setup tools, well, because distutils on which setup tools is based is is pretty grotty, and then setup tools it makes it makes it even grottier. And it's awful hard to describe to new users how to use this stuff. The, the docs are miserable. Uh, there, there's also sort of uh, accompanying technologies like virtual env and, and other things that, that people tend to associate with, with this stuff to when, when, when more than one package needs to be installed, they have to sort of make sure that they don't pollute their system Python and, and other stuff. And it's awful hard to document. So I, so I, so I, I, I take pity on, P, any, on anyone who has to document that stuff. And I understand completely why, why you wouldn't want to do that. Um, so, you know, who's going to pay for that? You know, it's, it's not really worth it to, to, to a lot of people. Um, that said, I'm, I'm going to make a bit of a, mor a morality play here, which is that, uh, you know, I understand why people ignore these issues. At the same time, ignoring them is not helping to improve them. And uh, I, uh, I think that uh, I'm trying to find the right way to say this. Uh, Python packaging is in a sorry state right now, and uh, and it's and it's been in a sorry state for almost 10 years. And um, I think it's, it's a bit of a, uh, a false pretense that someone isn't going to need to know about this stuff anyway. I think once you get past sort of the tutorial, you're inevitably going to be faced with having to learn PIP, probably having to learn virtual and probably having to learn something about setup tools and dependencies and all this stuff. And so while, while this is great for someone who just walks up to the system for the first time, I think you know, it might force us to make Python packaging better if, if the default tutorial in, the, in Django encouraged people to use both virtual env and explained how to use setup tools or at least, you know, apologize for setup tools. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this would sort of float all boats, I think. Uh, that's my opinion about that. Um, so, done with the morality play about, about, uh, about docs. Oops. Wow. Um, so another thing that I that that uh, I'm not on the same page with Django about is is that lots of its lots of the way you you extend Django or use Django is through this subclassing interface. Uh, you know, class-based views are an example. Forms are an example. Other things and and, and subclassing is definitely convenient. You don't have to explain to people how to, how to subclass something. You, you, can, you can punt and say, go read the Python documentation about subclassing. And here's how it works. And there's fantastic documentation about that. And probably people already know it when they, when they first come, come to Python because they might, they might have used another object-oriented language that has inheritance and it works very similarly. But um, particularly when, when you're trying to 
to offer some API to somebody that's, that's very well understood. It's, it's, it's often a, a worse choice than just, just offering up composition. I'll, I'll give you an example of this in a little bit. Uh, people start depending on, on implementation details of the subclasses and override things that they might shouldn't. And you know, it's, it's kind of like a Swiss Army chainsaw. I, uh, it, it's, it's, it's really not uncommon to see a subclass of a subclass of a subclass who, raise your hand if you have had more than five, five editor windows open working on your Django project to, to try to debug a view. Okay. So you know what I'm talking about. <coughs> uh, I, I know this well, by the way, because, uh, you know, I, I, I used to use Zope and we used to, have, we used to do the same thing. It was, it, was, it was terrible. It was terrible. Uh, so here's an example of a pyramid class-based view. Uh, this is not. This is this is different than a than a Django class-based view. A pyramid class-based view is a is a class that has a constructor that takes one argument, which is a request, and then it has another method, and the other method is called this name doesn't matter. This name doesn't matter, uh, and on top of it is is sort of this this little bit of hair called a, a view config decorator that names a route named Fred. So so what should happen in a in a in a system that uses this, this class is that when a request comes in that matches the route name Fred, that method will be executed and, and, a, and Fred will be printed to the user's web browser. Um, the way that that happens is that when, when the framework notices that you're registering a class or really a method as a view, it, it computes, it, it creates an instance of that foo, so we have this foo class over here, which is a view. It passes it the request in its, as its first argument, first and, first and only argument, and then it calls this name doesn't matter on it to get the response. Um, this is kind of like the J Django class-based view system, but as we'll see, it's, there's, there's a critical difference. Um, by the way, you, you don't have to subclass anything in order for this to work. This, this sort of works out of the box. It, it, a scan will pick up this, uh, that, that, the, this view config decorator over here will be picked up by, a, by an external subsystem. I, I won't try to explain that right now, but you can read about how that works in the pyramid docs. Um, so what, what's different about the pyramid view-based stuff is that you can actually add more than one view to the class. So the class itself is not the view, it's really the method that's the view on it. And so and I, as far as I understand, and somebody's, somebody's gonna come up here and smack me with two by four, I'm sure, but um, the, the, the Django class-based view stuff has a dispatch method, method, and in order to do anything different, you have to sort of either override the dispatch method or something that the, that, that the dispatch method of the superclass calls. Um, that the same is not true in Pyramid. You can sort of just hang an arbitrary number of views off of this class. And you can actually get at this instance inside of your template. So inside of your template, you could say view dot something and compute some, some stuff. This sort of is a bundle of state about some collection of views. How much time do I have left? 15, okay. Um, so, uh, enough ranting about, about subclassing. I'm gonna to start to rant about globals. And I'm sure, uh, from what I understand, uh, this, this Django con has been all about globals. Um, I won't harp on it too much, but uh, my, my complaints are probably very similar. Uh, you have sort of things that, when, 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 when you have global state in your application, you can't have more than one application per process. You have to sort of move imports into function scope in case something is not, in case an environment variable is not defined or there's a circular import problem or whatever. Uh, but the nice thing about it is that the, the protocol is simple. You can, you can import something and everybody understands import. And that's, I think that's the reason it's, it's like the way it is now because it's, it's easy to understand. It fits people's brains. Um, my argument is that I don't think that that is reasonable for ever you know I, I think it's I think it's I think it's pretty reasonable for a long time but and I th and I think really at some point it's kind of like who cares you know it, it works you know uh, I'm proud I might be the only one of the only people who cares 
um, who even who even would would complain about it. But uh, in Pyramid, we don't we don't actually do this. We 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 have like a configuration phase where we pass in a dictionary of settings to a configurator object, which represents the application, and then when the application runs, we can access those settings through, through an API that's hanging off the request object. So we can actually run more than one pyramid application per process. You know, there's no globals. The only global that's, about, that's, that's in there is this sort of settings dictionary, but that's not really a global because it's, it's inside of this if name equal main. Does people remember that Python 101 lesson of if name equal main script thing? So. Uh, uh, another thing is that module scope work is also convenient, but can be a, can be a, a downside. Uh, from the Django tutorial, uh, you know, this, this code imports this admin object, which is a global, and calls auto discover on it. This happens at module scope, and no one, we don't care about the return value of, of auto discover. We're just telling it, right now, go auto discover. And the problem with that is that it real, it's, it's sort of relying on the, on a, on the imp side effect of being imported to, to do some work. And also, you can never have more than one application per process because it's completely process global. It's going to mutate this admin object when it does this work. Um, and um, in my opinion, anyway, th this is, these are the things that can safely be done, sanely be done at module scope in a, in a Python module. Um, you can you can define a variable. You can define uh, uh, you can import something. You can define a function via def. You can define a class via class, and then you can have sort of sprinkle it with with con flow control logic in case something can't be imported or you know there's 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 understood failure modes of of some of the some of the other stuff. Everything else is kind of suspect. If if you see code that sort of runs at module scope but doesn't care about the return value of what it gets. It's usually probably a not not great. Or at least at least it's at least you're always going to be using global scope at that point. And it's probably it's probably going to limit the the execution model and it's probably going to make testing harder, those two things. Um, so instead of instead of that it might be better to have a have a uh, explicit configuration object and then call auto discover on it instead of instead of sort of importing the admin object and uh, and uh, calling auto discover on it. You you know I, I also passed in sort of the app names. I don't know if auto discover takes these, but you know if you could just tell it which apps to discover. I didn't go look at the docs. It probably already has something like that. But um, and the, the 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 benefit of this is that the state being mutated is not global. It's uh, it's uh, it's local to this if name equal main block. Okay, so another another thing. This is this is maybe a little softer, uh, and I don't really have good evidence about this. Uh, I don't have any sort of code to show, but I have a sense that the idea of pluggable apps is maybe at the wrong level, and this isn't really a Django problem. This is just more of a sort of a marketing issue. I don't think that, I think that pluggable apps are probably less pluggable than you think they are. And I think they're probably, uh, and reusable apps are a lot less reusable than you think you are. And I think, I think probably if, if, you know, in a quiet room together, you would admit to me that you probably fork most of your pluggable apps or reusable apps. And that means they're not really pluggable and reusable. That doesn't mean they're not useful. It just, it just, you know, the, the, the moniker doesn't fit, fit the, uh, fit the app. So uh, I, I don't think a framework as, uh, Django is a pretty high level framework. I don't think even a, even a framework as high level as Django can really advertise this feature in, with a straight face. Um, I think really the only thing that can offer pluggable apps is another app. You know, J Jenkins is a good example. If, if anyone has ever set up Jenkins, it's got all these plugins for subversion and, and other things. That's a perfect model, you know. They, it just, it just kind of works. Plone is another thing. Plone, you just download some app and it plugs into the admin interface. As long as you don't try to program in Plone, you can just use it as an app. Um, WordPress, we won't even talk about WordPress. Um, another thing that, that kind of 
kind of bugs me is that I think rendering is meta view, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by this. This is, a, this is an example of a Django view function that takes a request, calls this render to response function with the template name, and a, I'm sure everybody's used this, or at least one of its variants in the past. Um, I think this is actually the wrong model. I think views should probably be able to return other kinds of objects, not just responses, and, and, and let, the, let the framework take care of turning those, turning, turning those responses or those results into, into responses. Um, in Pyramid, the same sort of pattern, you could, you could use a renderer to do this. So this view returns a dictionary, and, and we have a Mako renderer that will render this, this dictionary into some, some HTML. And the reason, uh-oh. What have I done? Oh, the, the reason that this is a, a good idea, so we have, this, we have this view function. This view config decorator thingy doesn't actually mutate the function it's decorating. It, it sort of just marks it up for, for something to find later. So when you import a view from this module, what you see is what you get. When you call it, it will return a dictionary named username with user request username. And so when you go to test it, you can just sort of make some dummy objects and assert that when you call it, a dictionary comes back. This, you know, this is a whole other topic about testing and stuff. This is this is a this is you know sort of traditional unit test thing. Most people, I think, in Django land will use functional tests, system tests, integration tests, whatever, because it's, it's kind of hard to mock up the, the state required to, to do the application. But at the same time, if you don't need the stuff, these tests run way faster than, than those tests, those system tests. And, and they're, they're usually just as good in testing what you, and, and easier to write. You can also decorate a pyramid view with more than one renderer, so that uh, you can reuse the same function, but you can, you can hook it up to aView.json and that'll return a JSON rendering of the thing, or you can hook it up to aView.html and that'll return some rendering that uses Mako. So you just don't have to repeat yourself or, or break your thing into three functions, two, you know, one of which is a general thing and then two others which one does the JSON and one does the template. Um, Unit tests, I, you know, uh, Carl's had a uh, talk about this before. Um, sort of, I think the, the typical Django testing model is to use the Django test client. And that's pretty slow. Um, it, it, it's gonna make your tests run more, more slowly than necessary. And the, the problem with that is that you won't run your test before you commit and you'll have worse, worse software. Um, and also sort of, you know, people who don't understand that that's not the only kind of testing come to other systems and have pretty poor testing practices if, if they're able to write unit tests. So um, another issue is static files. It's probably time to consider trying to make use of Python WSGI servers now that we, we sort of have WSGI servers that are capable of, uh, capable of rendering static files pretty, pretty easily. They have send file and, and things like that. It's probably no, not much purpose in offloading it to some, some other server except for except for high volume production stuff. Um, okay, that's the end of my butt, and I won't criticize anymore during this talk. I feel terrible. Uh, uh, community, pyramid of community is maybe five or 10% the size of Django, it's growing. Uh, I'm pretty satisfied that it's sort of fight out, fight out, fight out the number two spot in the Django uh, <laughs> Python, Python web framework world. Um, you know, I don't know, you know, Flask is another contender, you know, Bottle, and there's some other things. I'm, I'm fine to do that forever. I'm happy to let you guys have all the uh, people who come in and want to write their first, their first web program. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, so some, some, some ways that we might collaborate, though, you know, the, the, some people have floated these ideas, you know, create an adapter for WebOb that exposes a Django request API, and wrap SQL Alchemy in a Django compatible ORM wrapper and other stuff. And I, I think these things are probably loser, loser ideas. Um, they're, they're just really complicated and, and things change really fast. Nobody's gonna pay for, the, pay for them and by the time they get done, everybody's gonna move on, have moved on anyway. So uh, it might, might be 
better to try to use sort of common non-domain specific things like setup tools, virtual env, middleware, you know, and in particular share, share some documentation burden. Um, you know, even if we, we had to fork separately some shared code, some shared documentation to document th things in context. Um, Django is sort of limited by backwards compatibility. It's just you, you, your users would kill you if you if you made some some serious um, backwards incompatible changes. But it m might be possible to take useful bits out of Django, sort of work on them independently, and factor them so factor them out so that they're useful outside of you know the larger whole, and then create another package that sort of gloms them all back together again to get backwards compatibility back. I don't know. I mean, you, you might consider doing that. I'm not sure how important it is. You know, after hearing Jeff talk about how we're doomed to extinction anyway, I don't think we should all just party anyway. But uh, uh, you might, if you did consider doing this, you might consider using Pyramid or another Python web framework to use as a base because it has a bunch of stuff that's useful for that sort of thing. And here are my challenges. I, I challenge you to investigate how other frameworks work, you know, whether it be Pyramid or another one. I challenge you to embrace existing Python packaging and distribution tools, hinted. Uh, and I challenge you to contribute to efforts that more directly benefit the broader Python web community. And that is the end of my talk. I have image, images here, which I'm required to show. <laughs> Be happy to take questions. So. Alex, oh, yeah, you might. People are me meant to get up there and get to the microphone. Uh, okay, so my questions about one of your final slides had uh, sharing middle middleware as one kind of thing that we might share in common. Mm -hmm. So comparing what Django calls middleware and Wisgi middleware, one of the one of the differences is that when you write a Django specific middleware, and I think this is more broadly true when you're writing reusable components is that you have a much uh, broader surface area of things you can assume and APIs that you can use yeah. in a Django middleware uh, because of assumptions that Django makes or uh, things that Django enforces. And you, a lot of those things you can't do in a WSGI middleware. So I'm wondering if you have particular examples in mind of things that you think we could First of all, do you think WSGI middleware is a good way for us to share a lot of code? And if so, what are particular examples of things that you think we could be or ought to be sharing that way? Uh, unfortunately, it's sort of a throwaway word, I guess, because uh, I actually don't think that WSGI middleware is a great way to share things. I, I used to think it was. I, you know, I sort of predicated a, a system on it, you know, in 2007 or something, and it wound up sucking. Uh, so for the reason that you say you don't have you don't have access, you know, functional composition is a is a poor is a is a poor API and poor extensibility platform. Um, so in even in Pyramid, we don't we don't actually use it in middleware middleware in Pyramid. We've sort of reinvented middleware inside of Pyramid actually to to for for just the reason you're talking about. So, uh, so yeah, thanks very much. I don't. I, in terms of the criticisms, I think you're dead on the money with, with a lot of them. They're not, they're not things we're not aware of. We're just kind of a combination of being backed into a corner for legacy reasons and uh, like the admin registration thing is something that exists for a really bad reason and we want to try and fix it. We've got some ideas of how to fix it. It's just kind of, well, it works now enough yep. that we can live with it. However, in terms of the, uh, the, the working together, I compl also completely agree that you know, rising tide lifts all boats and, and if we can help you, you can help us, the entire web community gets better. One of the areas where we do share a very common problem is deployment. So for example, at PHP, one of the reasons it succeeds is that you can just take a PHP file, stick it, FTP it up, and it runs. Yep. That's not true of any Python framework at all growing, becoming more common with, with things like Heroku, but even Heroku, it's the Heroku standard, not the, the Python framework standard. Yep. Have you had any thoughts about where we can start, co or have we, have, that we could start coordinating on, on building that kind of common, this is how you deploy a Python app um, standard? I think, uh, like I said, I think shared conventions are really important. So, you know, if you want to deploy a Django, I mean, if, you know, Django, can, uh, Django app can run under WSG, but, but WSG is just sort of the protocol between the server and the, and the app, and it really, it doesn't solve any deployment problems at all. It's just sort of 
lingua franca, but there are, there are sort of higher level things like you need some somewhere to hang some code, you know, that, that can get run, that everybody agrees on that's the right place to hang the code. I, I happen to think it's probably set up pi, you know, and probably just, you know, set up tools in some, some way or, or, or some set of tools derivative or whatever, but, you know, reasonable people can argue about it. Um, so I think it's mostly a matter of, of agreeing on some standards for, for how we do that in the, at a higher level than WSGI. Just as, a, as an aside, I don't, I don't know if you're hanging around for the sprints at all, but um, there was some talk, a couple of the deployment guys just having a talk about trying to get agreeing between them how to package up things so that everybody has a Yeah, I'd, I'd like, yeah, I, I will be sticking around, so okay. yeah. cool, thank you. Um, so if Django is gonna do the explosion of the monolithic package into sub-packages, um, what can you recommend from your experience from the Zope and Plone and Pyramid uh, work to help Django to not make the same mistakes that were done in the past? For example, if um, Django ORM becomes a separate package, the package manager needs to worry about the, the right version being packaged with and so forth and so forth. Yeah. So what are your recommendations? Because um, I think that's going to be very, very um, important in the next yeah. year. I think, I think that's just another example of, of of uh, we need to collaborate on on sort of better installation and deployment tools. I mean, I I happily use build out myself to do to to sort of pin versions and stuff. I know it's not for everybody. It's sort of doesn't fit doesn't fit some people's brains. Um, and I don't think it's I don't think it's probably wise to hand it off to some guy who's just started programming. But um, but I think something like you know pip where it has the requirements text and you can specify versions inside of it you know you might you might say pip install requirements text or whatever and get the, get all the right versions of that stuff for that particular version of Django. Okay. Like uh, they're out of time, but build out is actually getting more friendlier, and build out and virtual env are not mutually exclusive. I'll just right. point that out instead of my comment. Sorry. Cool. <laughs> okay. Thank you.